among four grand strategies. And what I want to do is I want to lay out each of those grand strategies for you and then explain to you which one we took and then why we got ourselves into a heap of a lot of trouble, okay? Uh, first grand strategy that the United States can choose is isolationism, which as many of you know was what the United States chose pretty much up until 1941 when we went into World War II. Uh, isolationism is not a viable strategy today, but the logic that underpins isolationism is very powerful. In this room, when I teach students, I always say you want to pay very serious attention to the logic underpinning isolationism. The re reason that Franklin D. Roosevelt had such enormous difficulty defeating the isolationists in the 30s and very early 40s was because there's a powerful logic that underpins it. And isolationism basically says that the United States is physically separated from those areas of the world that have other great powers by giant moats called the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. And because it's almost impossible to cross those moats and attack the United States, we are remarkably secure. And when you marry that simple fact with the fact that we have thousands of nuclear weapons, it's hard to see why we should care who dominates Europe or who dominates Asia. So what if Imperial Germany or Nazi Germany dominates Europe, they can't get at us. So what if Imperial Japan or some future Chinese threat dominates China? How are they going to get across the Pacific Ocean? As you all know, the Pacific Ocean is 6,000 miles wide. You think there's going to be a Normandy-like invasion on the California beaches as the Chinese Navy transports troops 6,000 miles across the Pacific Ocean? Not going to happen. It's that kind of logic that underpins isolationism hard to argue against. This is what Roosevelt was up against. I'm not an isolationist. That's the first choice. Second choice, which is my favorite, and which I'll talk about later on, is what's called offshore balancing. Offshore balancers like me believe that there are three areas of the world that really matter. Europe, Northeast Asia, and the Persian Gulf. Europe and Northeast Asia matter because that's where the great powers are and their potential threats to the United States. And the Middle East or the Persian Gulf matters because that's where oil is. And oil is a critical resource like none other, okay? So we have to care about the Gulf. Those are the three areas that Americans should be willing to fight and die over. Then the question becomes, how do you fight and die in those areas? When do you fight and die in those areas? My argument is you build military forces to fight in those areas but you don't go into those areas unless there's one country in the region that threatens to dominate it, to take it over, to become what I would call a regional hegemon. You go to war against Imperial Germany in 1970, 17. You go to war against Nazi Germany in 1941. You stay in Europe after World War II to deal with the Soviet threat. You go to war in the Pacific in December 1941 to deal with Imperial Japan. Those are potential threats to the United States because there's a serious possibility they'll dominate the entire region, which is not in America's interest. Otherwise, you stay offshore. That's offshore balancing. Again, three areas of the world that matter. Three areas of the world that are worth fighting and dying for, and you only fight and die in those regions where there's a potential hegemon that needs to be contained and where you're essential to make containment work. Third strategy. First is isolationism. Second is offshore balancing. The third is called selective engagement. Selective engagement says that there are three areas of the world that matter. John is correct. Those three areas of the world matter. But it's our job to keep the peace in those areas. It's not only our job to deal with a potential hegemon, that's offshore balancing. It's our job to be in the region to keep peace. Let me give you an example. When the Cold War ended, Soviet Union went away. John said, as an offshore balancer, let's get out of Europe. I'd pull everything out of Europe. I'd pull everything out of Europe. There's no potential hegemon in the region. 
right? I take everything out. The idea that we're spending absurd amounts of money to defend rich Europeans who have wonderful infrastructure while our infrastructure is going to hell in a handbasket drives me crazy. Let the Europeans defend themselves. If Adolf Hitler comes back from the dead, Germany goes on another rearmament campaign, then I'm willing to come back in. But absent that, I stay out. I let them pay for themselves. I'm an offshore balancer. Most of my realist friends disagree with me. They say, John, we have to stay in Europe to keep the peace. The Europeans are dangerous to themselves and ultimately dangerous to us. Let's stay over there and play the role of Uncle Sugar Daddy. Okay, that's selective engagement. It's selective because they think that three areas of the world matter, like the offshore balancers think. It's just that they favor maintaining peace over dealing with potential hegemons, okay? So it's isolationism, offshore balancing, selective engagement. Then we come to the fourth grand strategy, which is the most important for my story, global domination. And this is the idea that the United States should dominate the globe. There are no three important areas. All areas are important. You dominate the globe. You're willing to use military force anywhere. I think this view is best captured by Madeleine Albright's famous or infamous, depending on your viewpoint, comments that we are the indispensable nation. We stand taller and we see further. This is Madeleine Albright basically saying that we not only have a right, but we have a responsibility to run the world. We have the right to stick our nose in everybody else's business. Right. Global domination. Global domination is the grand strategy that we adopted after 1989. And it remains our grand strategy. We believe that we have a responsibility to run the world. It's imperial by design. Now, very importantly, there are two kinds of global dominators. One are the neoconservatives who are aligned in large part with the Republican Party. And two are the liberal imperialists who are aligned with the Democratic Party. And let me tell you what the difference between the two is. The difference is that the neoconservatives hate international institutions and privilege the unilateral use of military force. The liberal imperialists, on the other hand, love international institutions. They're always talking about multilateralism, which is a euphemism for institutions. They love international institutions, and they're not unwilling to use military force, but they're quite skittish. Think about Bill Clinton in the 1990s. Bill Clinton had an administration that was filled with global dominators, as did George W. Bush, his successor. But Bill Clinton had liberal imperialists driving the train. You remember, Bill Clinton refused to use ground forces against Bosnia in 1995, or in Bosnia in 1995, or against Serbia in the war over Kosovo in 1999. Very reluctant to get too involved. You remember what happened in Somalia when those soldiers were killed? We quickly cut and ran. And then the next year, that was 1993, the next year, 1994, we sat out the genocide in Rwanda because we were so spooked. The liberal imperialists were so spooked by what happened in Somalia. Right? And every time we used military force, we tried to do it multilaterally. We wanted allies to get involved. Right? We wanted to work through institutions like the UN and NATO and so forth and so on. But the goal was global domination. After September 11th, the neoconservative strand of global domination moved to the fore. And you all remember the Bush doctrine. You remember the rhetoric after Afghanistan fell and before we went into Iraq, where we believed that we could act unilaterally with our military force to reshape the world in our own image. This is Fukuyama and Krauthammer coming home to roost, right? 
It's the idea that the United States has this incredibly powerful military, right, and the wind at its back, and doesn't need allies, because we're not going to do it diplomatically. We're going to do it with the big stick. And we, we have a stick that's so big that we don't need a lot of help. Most of you probably don't remember this, but right before the Iraq War, which started on March 19, 2003, George Bush dialed up Tony Blair, and he told Tony, if you don't want to go with us, you don't have to go. Because he knew that Tony Blair was the only guy in Britain who wanted to go. Virtually everybody else in Britain thought this was a Looney Tunes operation, including everybody in his government. But Tony wanted to go. Bush didn't want to get him in trouble. Bush called him up, says, you don't have to go if you don't want. And the reason he called him up and said that was because we didn't need him. The American military could do it pretty much by itself. And we took Saddam down very easily. Right? So it's the whole idea that you can do things unilaterally. If you have doubts about military force and you have to use diplomacy, where you think that the military operation is going to get messy, then you need allies. And of course, think about what happened once Iraq or once Afghanistan goes south. Then we start begging everybody to come and help us police the place, because it's a mess and you need help. But if you believe the big stick is going to you know, produce quick and decisive victories, to put it in Muhammad Ali's terms, you believe it's going to allow you to float like a butterfly and sting like a bee, you do not need lots of allies. And that's the neoconservative worldview. Unilateralism, not multilateralism, and the big stick. And that's what you see with Republicans. Democrats, both in the 1990s under Bill Clinton and now under Barack Obama, they're interested in global dominance, just like the neocons. But the difference is the liberal Democrats uh, are uh, more skittish about military force. Okay. The key event that really flips us is September 11th. And after September 11th, which happened shortly after Bush gets elected, the, uh, uh, the neoconservatives really uh, are able to convince uh, key players in the Bush administration that they have the magic formula, which is again a combination of the Fukuyama Krauthammer worldview. Of course, this ends up not working, and we're in the mess that we see before us today, and that I described at the beginning of this talk. Now, the question is what went wrong? H how did we end up in such a mess? The argument I want to make is that we made three fundamental errors. Number one, we misunderstood the terrorist threat. Number two, we did not have a healthy appreciation of the limits of military force. And number three, and most remarkably, we did not understand how difficult it was to spread democracy at the end of a rifle barrel. The three different flaws in this grand strategy. And before I go on, I want to make a quick point. As I said to you, there is this divide among the global dominators between the neoconservatives and the liberal imperialists. But you want to remember that after September 11th and after the war in Afghanistan, when Bush was pushing us to go to war against Iraq, that he had much support from Democrats. He had much support from the liberal imperialists. I'm going to explain why this is the case in due course. But the idea that Bush went to war and the liberal imperialists opposed him is simply wrong. You all understand that George Bush, I mean, excuse me, Barack Obama does not have a single foreign policy advisor who opposed the Iraq war. Every single one of Barack Obama's advisors favored the Iraq war. The only person in that administration who was opposed to the war was Barack Obama himself. Right. This just shows you the extent to which the liberal imperialists and the neoconservatives came together. And it happened after Afghanistan, and I'll talk about that in due course. Okay, first let's just talk about the terrorist threat and how we blew that. Three ways we blew it. First of all, Bush says 
that the threat is global. In other words, we have to go after every terrorist organization on the planet. And furthermore, he says that states like Iraq, Iran, Syria, this is the famous or infamous axis of evil, those states, what are sometimes called rogue states, are inextricably linked or tied to terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda. So Bush says, not only do we have to take out every terrorist group on the planet, we've got to take out rogue states too, because they're joined at the hip with these terrorist organizations. This is crazy. First of all, there are terrorist groups all over the planet. Beating them is very difficult, as we've discovered with Al-Qaeda. It can be done, but it's very difficult. The idea that you're going to take on all of these terrorist groups at once is really asking for trouble. Furthermore, the idea that states like Iraq, Iran, and Syria are friendly with Al-Qaeda is simply wrong. Iran helped us defeat the Taliban in Afghanistan in the fall of 2001. Syria, as Seymour Hersh has documented in The New Yorker, played a key role in cooperating with us to defeat some terrorist attacks after September 11th. And there was no evidence, despite prodigious efforts by the Bush administration to show otherwise, that Saddam and Osama bin Laden were linked at the hip. In fact, they didn't like each other at all. So the idea that we had to take out rogue states because they were joined at the hip with terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda was simply wrong. In fact, they would have been important allies in that fight. And again, the last thing you wanted to do was take on terrorist groups that didn't have their gun sights on you. That's one mistake we made. Another mistake we made is we just greatly overestimated how dangerous the threat was. I mean, there's no question that we got whacked good on September 11th. Nobody would deny that. It was a devastating attack. But it was never duplicated. They've never come close. What's the terrorist threat that we have faced since September 11th? The shoe bomber? The underwear bomber telling me we're spending more money than the rest of the world put together on defense to deal with the shoe bomber? The underwear bomber? Is there a terrorist threat that we face? Of course there is. Is it a serious threat? Yes. How serious? Not that serious. I'm sorry. Right. Does not justify all the hype that we've heard since September 11th. And we've had constant references to imminent attacks. There's been no imminent attacks, nothing close to an imminent attack.